Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory. I'm very glad to be able to introduce you today our uh, keynote speaker, uh, editor of the volume uh, we are uh, presenting today in the Washington trial, Professor Timothy Waters from Indiana University, uh, Indiana Law School. Uh, together with us today is also Alexander Fatic, a senior research uh, fellow at the Institute uh, for Philosophy and Social Theory. Okay. Oh, that's good. We should have started earlier, maybe. Uh, this book has already been described by some authors as uh, the major book dealing with the Washington trial and one of the major books referring to the tribunal in The Hague and uh, the attempt to establish peace and justice in the region of the Balkans or Western Balkans as it is referred uh, to this region nowadays uh, as the major uh, driving force of the establishment of the tribunal itself. This will be one of the key topics that we will discuss today. Uh, was the tribunal in The Hague successful in this attempt or not? Uh, what are the views of various authors that uh, wrote uh, very different uh, texts for this volume from many different perspectives? Some of the authors uh, are professionals who are directly involved in the Washington process, people from the tribunal in The Hague. Others are researchers who approach it from a more scientific point of view. Uh, and among the authors that you will find in this volume uh, are Carlos of Ponte, uh, Klaus Bachmann, Florence Arkman, Vesta Pesic, who is also uh, together with us today here, and many, many others. Uh, without further delay, I would like to invite Professor Waters to tell us something about his motivation to work on such a project, uh, criteria, uh, how all these orders were selected, and also to address, uh, at least in part, this issue uh, of tribunal in The Hague and uh, its main goal, which actually was uh, how it was justified, its foundation to establish peace in the region, and this very, not only legal, but also philosophical, tension that we very often have between peace and justice that are very often uh, not only the same but very often quite different things. Thanks, Thanks very much. Uh, I really appreciate the chance to present uh, here, especially uh, in, in Belgrade. Um, I, I'm the editor of the book and there are 28 uh, authors, so I am hesitant, one of them here, I am hesitant to speak about the book as a whole, uh, the authors certainly don't agree with each other. So I will say a few things about the book specifically at the, at the end of my comments. Uh, but what I want to do at the start basically is present two frames for thinking about the trial and its effects that I think anyone has to uh, use or look at if they're going to talk about this trial. And, and then make one argument in my own voice uh, about its uses for, for uh, history. Uh, what, what I want to show is, is uh, that this trial tells us quite a bit about what trials and tribunals can and can't do uh, when it comes to writing history and promoting uh, reconciliation after violence. So I'll speak for about 20 minutes about this theme and, and then a bit about the book. Um, this, as you doubtless all know, this trial was certainly the flagship case at the ICTY. It was supposed to be. Um, there's no other trial that had anything like the same level of attention or resources put into it at the tribunal, or the same expectations attached to it. Expectations for an, an accounting for these wars, for closure for victims, and I would argue also a proof of the ICTY as a concept itself. And then of course, you know, in 2006, Milosevic dies, leaving the tribunal, the peoples of the former Yugoslavia, uh, and uh, all of us without a definitive resolution. So what was supposed to be the most consequential trial ends up becoming a footnote. And it really is true if you look at the literature, research on the tribunal, uh, Milosevic as a trial is a very small footprint. And so for me, this is a kind of puzzle. What, what happened to everything that trial was supposed to be after he died? 
Uh, for me, that's why actually it's worth examining this trial, because all of those expectations around the trial weren't just inchoate wishes, they are theories. They were theories about what a trial could do or should do. So by examining this trial, uh, this is my purpose, I think, to see what it did and it didn't do, um, in a way this is a kind of natural experiment in how we deploy law uh, after violent conflict. So, as I said, I want to describe two frames for thinking about the trial and, and then make an argument. Um, and those two frames are first the enormous ambitions that were attached to this trial and the second its premature termination. So the first, the ambition. Uh, this trial was important in part because of who Milosevic was, a sitting head of state, right, the first sitting head of state uh, or head of state charge in an international tribunal since um, right after World War II. Um, the master architect of Yugoslavia's demise, you know, he, he denied many things during the trial, but he never denied his importance as a figure. Um, and acts that had already been or were going to be tried in separate trials now joined in a single case with a single theory that implied claims about the meaning of the wars as a whole, and claims, that I, as I will suggest, about history. Um, the case that the prosecution brought put Milosevic at the very center of a web of criminality, what's known, known as a joint criminal enterprise in the parlance of the tribunal, and indeed it was his place at the center that provided the relationship for all the other acts um, and the actors across all three of the wars uh, and across a whole decade. If, if you look at the tribunal's website, it lists 46 other cases to which Milosevic is linked. That is far more than any other trial. Um, it is the only trial that links actors from all three of the wars, Kosovo, Bosnia, and Croatia. Um, if there was a Serbian criminal network, Milosevic is the network. There is no one else who makes it. And so, in a sense, although Milosevic was a single person on trial in his individual capacity, this is the theory by which the tribunal operates, his trial was also seen as the culmination of the tribunal's work as a whole, an indictment of the Serbian war project and a summation of Yugoslavia's dissolution. And I think it is from this fact that it also is these broader themes that are at issue that so many of the qualities we see in the trial proceed. Uh, its expansive nature, uh, its unnavigable flood of documents, 1.2 million pages just from the prosecution, um, but also its ambition, its depth, and its comprehensiveness, and as I will return to, its reliance on history. All of these features proceed from its uh, enormous ambition, I think. The, the other fact that we have to keep in mind when thinking about this trial, from whatever perspective, is how it ended. Um, Every aspect of this trial is viewed through the prism of its premature termination, which left every question open. You know, normally when a trial ends, we focus on the judgment and read everything through that. But here, with no judgment, we have nothing but the process to consider. And for some people, this is the answer to the puzzle I suggested. Why does this trial not matter more? Uh, without a judgment, what is its significance? But I think that's not actually a very good answer. It just begs the question, what was the trial? supposed to do. Not the judgment, but the trial itself. The fact that this trial ended early should draw our attention to the value of international trials as a form of process. Right? A trial that ends prematurely like this one lets us examine what, if any, effect the trial as a process has independent from its judgment. When we think about all of the hopes and expectations that surrounded this trial when it began, um, they were hopes for what the process would achieve as much as the judgment. So in the absence of judgment, we should, in a sense, be able to test or see these processes as more falsifiable. So as I said, these are two ways of framing the trial. They're not arguments as such. I would now like to turn to an argument that I want to make in my own voice, not necessarily that of the other authors, although it does draw on some of their work uh, and certain chapters in the, the book. Um, and that has to do with the way in which history was produced and used at the tribunal in the Milosevic trial and elsewhere. Um, one of the rationales for uh, uh, international criminal law as a project is to render authoritative judgments. Right? This idea that if you produce an authoritative claim through a legitimate process in a court, this is going to create shared understandings about the past, 
and create common space for reconciliation. This is a, a pretty common theory for international criminal law. In my chapter in the book, I address this theory and I call it the authoritative narrative theory. All right? This is an idea which might explain why we uh, have international trials. The, the strong version of this theory says that law or courts are particularly good at doing this, right? at crafting shared understandings, which means that they're particularly good at writing history. I, I know of no scholar who thinks this is the only reason to have trials, but it is a very common, uh, uh, commonly accepted rationale for why we have the ICTY, ICTR, and, and the ICC and, and others. So this suggests a role for thinking about and writing history in trials, and, and I want to develop this idea in the next few minutes. Um, and because uh, you probably haven't seen my book, I'll make reference to another recent book. It's Richard Wilson called Writing History in International Criminal Trials. It's an excellent book, uh, and it's a very good defense of the idea that history is important in trials. But and I, and a defense that I argue, to the degree it succeeds, shows just how limited the use of history at trial really is. So Wilson's argument, which, which I rely on too, uh, in, in, in my chapter, uh, is that courts use history a lot. They rely on it a lot, on history and the social sciences more generally uh, in producing judgments. Um, and they do it in order to sort out the meaning of complex webs of social violence. Wilson quotes uh, a, a prosecutor or a worker in the prosecution who says, you don't just kill that many people without a context. And context is what history and the social sciences provide. This is the idea, right? Um, and so we can identify three phases in which the tribunal has written about or made claims about history um, with Milosevic right in the center. So the, the first phase uh, begins with the first case, Tadic, right? And Tadic, as you know, right, is a pretty low-level actor, is a local political actor and works in a camp, and obviously his crimes are cr quite brutal, but they are not exactly world historical, right? They have no broader relevance, right? It's killing and rape and so forth, and sexual violence in a camp. Um, but at the trial, the prosecution produced, and ultimately in the judgment we find reflected, a, a very extensive primer on history, the history of Yugoslavia going way back without any causal relationship to his crimes. Right? No effort to say that this relates to the actual killings on the day. What we might call this judicial Wikipedia. Right? This is really lots of information that has no particular purpose and it's useful if you are curious and uninformed. And in fact, that was its purpose. The judges saw this as a exercise in educating the world and themselves because they were in fact quite ignorant about the former Yugoslavia by design. All of the judges uh, and most of the prosecution were selected as people who viewed their lack of knowledge as a proof of neutrality and professionalism and therefore they needed an education. And beyond that was the idea that this history written in the trial would provide an alternative for all of you to review your own history. There's a wonderful or terrible moment at the beginning of the Tadic trial, I think it's literally the first or second um, witness, is a political scientist, and the judges ask him, would he uh, please begin telling his history of Yugoslavia in the 14th century, right? And he says, I, I have to begin in the fourth. Okay, so this is history, uh, but it's not for the right reasons, right? It's not clear it's necessary. Um, the, the second phase I think we find in Milosevic itself, right, in the Milosevic trial. And Wilson, in his book, calls this, borrowing from Nietzsche, monumental history, right? A grand, sweeping meta-narrative that leads inexorably to the crimes of the accused. In other words, claims about history form an essential part of the prosecution's case in Milosevic. Uh, what I'm talking about is the idea of greater Serbia as a strategy, right? An explanation for the wars and for the, the, the crimes within them. Um, the idea that Serbian nationalism explains those wars, in other words. So the key difference in Milosevic from a case like Tadic is that history claims are doing real work in the case, providing essential parts of the prosecution's theory necessary for conviction. I need to stress, I don't mean this is the only evidence. Right? Most of the evidence is about killings, chains of command, and so forth. But claims about history and the perception of history are a key piece of interpretation. And there is a reason for this, an understandable reason why the prosecution chose this strategy at the time. 
As you know, the charges against Milosevic included probably the most ambitious and controversial charge, uh, genocide in Bosnia. Uh, but the prosecution, as you doubtless also know, had not exactly been very successful in its genocide cases in Bosnia, and it does not look like it ever will be, right? We're going to produce a jurisprudence that says there was genocide in one town in Bosnia and nowhere else. I find this, uh, as an aside, an extraordinarily uh, intellectually unsatisfying solution, uh, either all of Bosnia or none, but that it be in one place strikes me as a bizarre outcome. Um, but the point is, the prosecution confronted this reality that genocide turned out to be very hard to prove, and it knew that it did not have uh, clear, convincing documentary evidence of what we call special intent, right? The special intent to commit genocide, um, uh, which they would have needed. And in fact, they had just, right prior to this case, uh, the same prosecutor, Jeffrey Nice, who's the lead prosecutor of Milosevic, had just uh, completed the Yelisic case, you may also be familiar with this, another brutal camp guard uh, who pled guilty to 31 counts of everything except for genocide and was acquitted on that. So the prosecution fully understood that genocide was a very difficult charge, that it had no solid grounds uh, to win conviction. I'm not speaking about whether this is true or not true, just as a prediction of their prosecutorial strategy. So, without documentary proof, they look for another way to explain the charge. And their theory is to rely on a reading of Serbian nationalist history to, to supply the requisite animus, right, the proof of special intent. And incidentally, it serves a second purpose. It explains to the court why the three separate charges for Kosovo, Bosnia, and Croatia can be joined into a single case because the theory of joinder requires there to be some overarching relationship between all the different acts. And it's the claim that Milosevic is seeking to create or maintain a greater Serbia that judicially explains their unity. Right? So this is an essential part of the case procedurally and strategically. Now, Wilson in his book calls this a qualified success. Of course, we'll never know because there's no judgment, right? We won't know if the prosecution was on a path to uh, uh, win its case or not. But I think uh, we can say something about the problems with the strategy even so, because even if, uh, or shall we say to the degree that the prosecution relied on history, historical arguments, it's not clear it was actually on a path to prove anything relevant. Let's just look at one or two reasons why. Let us suppose that we accept the prosecution's view that uh, greater Serbia as an icon is important to Serbian nationalism and that it is inherently discriminatory. One could question whether this is true. Let's accept the idea. What does this prove in relationship to the mental state of Slobodan Milosevic? Did he himself share that sentiment? It is widely assumed, by the way, as you doubtless know, that he didn't. The man was not a nationalist in his heart. It's a great chapter in the book. I consider one of the best by Marko Prelec formerly of the prosecution, more recently of International Crisis Group, and now with a new group of his own. Uh, I think it's a devastating portrayal of how problematic this claim is, and Marco Prelitz should know he's probably one of the architects of the original theory, uh, relying on Serbian nationalism, and later uh, apostatized and figured that this was no longer the right case. He makes a devastating argument that, the, of course, relying on the Supreme Defense Council documents that Milosevic is not at the, in the least interested in a nationalist theory uh, himself. So even if Serbian nationalism explains life in Serbia, it doesn't necessarily say anything about the mental state of the defendant. If we think about the means used, the political project of greater Serbia could be achieved by a variety of means. Many means have been tried over the last 150 years to produce a larger Serbian state, and only some of them are criminal. Most are simply politics uh, uh, in the normal uh, course of things. So the things we need to prove the guilt of one individual, systematicity, planning, capacity to order, those elements of criminal intent can't be found in events before the 1990s, can't be found in history. If you think they can, you are, as one of my authors puts it, trafficking in crude notions of historical determinism. In short, history does not prove any element of legally relevant causality. It doesn't prove the capacity to act, to order. It doesn't show lines of authority in the present moment. It does do something else, though. The emphasis on history also placed before the court and the world um, 
broader claims about the material and social causes, causes of the conflict. So, for example, when at the beginning of the trial, the prosecution shows famous footage of Milosevic giving speeches in Kosovo Polia in 1989 before 600,000 people or something. The purpose in trial was to show early indications of his intent to violence. But of course, this is also a claim about the causes of Yugoslavia's dissolution. Implicit, in other words, in the prosecution's approach is precisely the kinds of nationalist and collectivist assumptions which the, supposedly the tribunal was supposed to combat. Milosevic, in other words, was probably right when he said that not only he, but the Serbian nation was on trial. And this is no secret, because precisely this theory is what made the prosecution's case attractive to so many people. The prosecution's theory explained the origins and the essential unity of the entire conflict from start to finish. It was a causal account useful to those constituencies, both in the former Yugoslavia and abroad, for whom the tribunal's purpose was to create a transformative narrative. We just won't know if it ever worked because the trial never finished. Now, as I say, there's a third phase, briefly. After Milosevic, uh, uh, we see a change in the prosecution's approach to history. In part, this is due to the completion strategy, the need to close the tribunal slowly, slowly. Um, but also, I think it's clear it's a reaction to the problems in the Milosevic trial itself. We don't have a judgment, but it's pretty clear the prosecution understood that it was not exactly in charge of its own case, and it was really not clear where this was going. So we find a third phase, which is a much reduced use of history, focusing instead on the actual structures used to commit crimes. Uh, the example of this would be, um, of this new model, uh, would be, for example, in the Burzanin trial, uh, reports on the crisis staffs, right, in, in Bosnian Serb uh, uh, municipalities, the actual structures used to control a particular region, uh, in some cases to, to cleanse the non-Serb populations. Uh, Wilson calls this micro-history, focusing on a very small set of events. I'm not even sure it's history as we naively or normally think of it. It's not talking about events over time. It's not looking at the past. It's talking about the structures for committing crimes in a discrete moment. So it's calling upon the skills of social scientists, but it's really something quite different. And I should stress, um, I think that historians and social scientists have skills that are enormously useful for processing complex criminal cases. Most of the people I worked with were actually historians and not uh, lawyers, and they were by far the most uh, intelligent and, and knowledgeable people in the tribunal. Many of the investigators and prosecutors had no idea what they were doing uh, whatsoever. Um, but that work inside a trial is very different from scholarship right, in the academy or in, in a university. Social science in a trial is undertaken for a specific and partisan purpose to prove guilt or to prove innocence. This imperative makes it very different from what scholars do in the university. I also should say I am not suggesting that tribunals get history wrong or that they produce nothing of value. They have, for one thing, produced an enormous archive which, if it is ever actually opened, will be very useful to historians in the future. It is just not clear this is a very good way to produce history and social science. And lastly, I should point that I, I'm not saying that context doesn't matter. Uh, I, I will say what I think matters in a moment, but history and social science are in fact useful and sometimes necessary to explain the context of violence in some cases. Um, the, the best example I know comes not from Yugoslavia but from the Rwanda tribunal, uh, the so-called media trial. Uh, uh, and there, it, one of the most notorious episodes is a call broadcast on the radio that it is, quote, time to cut the tall trees. This makes no sense at all unless you bring in those with expertise on the region to explain and, in a sense, interpret the horrendous meaning of this call. Um, the full horror of it is only possible to understand through an act of cultural translation. But, again, the purpose of doing that translation in a trial is specific and it is forensic. I'm taking sides with Hannah Arendt here, clearly. Um, context only matters to the degree it serves the purpose in trial, which is to prove guilt or innocence. Um, Interestingly, in his book, Wilson, 
uh, makes no claim that trials have broader value at all. He says, quote, existing international courts are simply not designed to fulfill other tasks such as conflict resolution, reconciliation, and deterrence. So we can see how minimal, uh, how reduced in scope and ambition a defensible history, uh, use of history in court is. It's hardly history at all. It is just minimal analysis of the elements necessary to prove a crime. So this brings me to the last point I want to make. Uh, how am I doing on time? Just oh, for lovely, great. Um, the last thing I want to address is is not the production of history, but the consumption of history. Um, because even if you think that trials are good at writing history, I, I clearly don't. But if you if you do, uh, it's a different question whether anyone or the right people are going to read it or what the effect would be. Now remember this theory I mentioned about authoritative narratives says that trials create truths and these truths lead to reconciliation. Um, you, you live in the former Yugoslavia, you may have your own view about how that's worked out. Um, several chapters in this book uh, address specifically the relationship, if any, of the Milosevic trial and the tribunal to uh, its reception in Serbia, Bosnia, Kosovo, and Croatia, and I think collectively they make a compelling case that the trial and the tribunal have had no influence uh, on narratives about the war or on moves towards reconciliation. I want to mention one other recent book. Uh, it's called The Legacy of the ICTY, although it's a fairly ironic name uh, if you actually read it. Uh, there's a, there is a good chapter in it by Janine Clark, uh, and she says something I think quite important. She says, the tribunal's truth is ultimately less important for reconciliation than everyday events taking place within individual communities. And she talks about what she calls the problem of rejected truth. And this gets at what I find so frustrating about so much thinking and scholarship about the ICTY and about international criminal law in general. Um, the idea, in other words, that if only we could improve the process, perhaps move from adversary to inquisitory <laughs> systems or something like that, um, we might produce a better truth that would lead to reconciliation. I think this, this view of the field misses the context in which those truths are received. Because the, the real problem with expecting truth from a tribunal is that its acceptance is not a question of procedure or design, but of politics and orientation. When we debate procedure, we simply replicate the underlying problem of international criminal law's relationship to politics. So when we try to fix procedural design, we simply uh, replicate uh, that context we read it out, but we don't erase it. What Marty Koskanimi, the Finnish scholar, reminds us is precisely the thing that is disputed in the individual actions that are the object of trial. So in theory, trials may create indisputable records that combat denial. They, they may produce good history. That might be a fair estimate of what they are doing or not, but it is a separate question. Uh, how they are received. And I think as a social fact in the former Yugoslavia today, the record is disputed, it is denied, and most fatally, it is ignored by large parts of the population. There's a difference between constructing an accurate record and getting anyone to read it. I think not much more than this can be expected from these tribunals. Their use for history, their production of history, requires us to adopt a minimalism that eschews almost every ambitious claim that has been made over 20 years for these institutions. That's not much, but I think not much more is defensible. And now, just to close, I'd like to say a few things to respond to your question about the, the book itself. Um, I think there'll be more comments on that, so I won't say much. Uh, I just want to say a bit in answer to your, to your uh, framing question about what I wanted the book to do. Um, maybe a few points. Uh, one goal was th that it be very much an interdisciplinary exercise. This is a very popular word in academia, but I actually took it seriously. I, I looked for three different kinds of authors, uh, people who were practitioners at the tribunal who actually worked on this trial. That's the first group. The second was people who are scholars of international criminal law or international law in general. Um, and the third were, were uh, experts on the former Yugoslavia from a variety of disciplinary perspectives. So some people who work in journalism, uh, uh, nationalism studies, political science, anthropology, a variety of, of, of fields, uh, but with expertise specifically in the region. 
Um, I also paired the chapters together in more or less formal conversation with each other. Sometimes that's quite loose, sometimes very close, uh, so that often you have someone who is uh, from one discipline and a response from one in another. So as, as a good example, um, someone who was the, uh, uh, was, uh, the federal foreign, uh, excuse me, justice minister in the Panic government, uh, Tibor Varadi, who's now at Central European University, uh, wrote a chapter in response to a chapter by Yuval Shani, who is one of the leading scholars of international courts uh, in the world. And so these two were related. Or similarly, Clint Williamson, who was the lead prosecutor on the Kosovo indictment, uh, uh, writes about that process, and I have him paired with Sharif Basayuni, who is unquestionably the leading scholar of international criminal law, who ran the commission of inquiry in Bosnia, uh, which never led to an indictment. So I, I tried to pair people from different disciplines or perspectives. Um, the other thing that I tried to do as editor, uh, I produced a very large set of introductory materials. We have four chapters on the history of the conflict, the tribunal, Milosevic's biography, and on the trial itself. The purpose of this was to produce a kind of shared uh, body of basic knowledge which would hopefully liberate my authors from having to reproduce it themselves. So in this book we do not have 34 chapters each saying the tribunal is founded in 1993. Right? There's one place where you can find that. The goal, in other words, was to produce a single book, even though it has 28 authors, that is somehow actually a book, um, and specifically to put this trial in a broader uh, context, to not talk only about process and institutions, but also its effects in the region. And, and I'll close here by saying, for me, the, what motivated me uh, was a challenge to my own discipline, uh, which I think is obsessed with talking about the internal workings of international criminal law inside institutions and measuring its success by how many courts exist, how much new jurisprudence we create, and almost never looks outside to see what happens in the places where, notionally, we hoped for an actual effect. This tribunal was designed, in theory, to respond to a particular conflict, set of conflicts in Yugoslavia, uh, and it is amazing how little attention that is given in most scholarship on the ICTY, and I saw this as an attempt to correct that. So I'll stop there. Again, my thanks for the chance to present it. Thank you very much, uh, for first of all, for this very comprehensive answer to my questions and for this uh, very thought-provoking uh, introduction to your book and the whole um, issue of the tribunal in The Hague and the Russian trial. And I'm sure that uh, um, all of you who are present here uh, have many questions uh, stemming from what Professor Water Waters has just said. But before that, I'll uh, turn to our dear colleague, Alexander Fatic, philosopher and also a public intellectual who uh, dealt in many of his uh, works with some of these issues that were raised here, uh, at least more general issues uh, like uh, individual guilt versus collective guilt, peace versus justice, uh, history versus present time, and the relevancy of all of that in trials like this one. So I would like to invite uh, uh, Alexander Fatish to share with us his thoughts on uh, these issues that were raised, as well as uh, the book uh, itself. Thank, thank you, Dawa. Um, uh, I will speak very briefly, and I will try to connect what I'm going to say with what Tim Walters has just said, namely that um, uh, focusing on this, on this idea that uh, the mission uh, of the tribunal of, of ICTI and uh, the trial of Milosevic, as they were perceived uh, from the point of view of the uh, relevant documents of the UN, and from the general, from the point of view of the general public expectations in the West, uh, were largely at odds with the real intentions of the trial and the tribunal. The real intentions being to create, to set the historical record straight, to create, as Tim has said, historical narratives. Uh, whereas the official uh, mission of the tribunal, as you know, is to uh, quote prevent impunity and contribute to reconciliation. So what does it mean to prevent impunity? To prevent impunity means to resort to the classic theory, theory of criminal sanctions, which is well known as the theory of deterrence. The idea that if you punish high-profile political leaders in the same way in which you punish ordinary criminals uh, uh, in the future, others who might be in a position to, uh, to, to incite wars and commit war crimes, 
will think twice. This is a theory that in, in criminal law and the theory of criminal sanctions has been considered highly dubious based on empirical evidence, but it, it could be that it is, it is a more, more uh, uh, plausible theory when it, when it applies to international crimes, it is to international humanitarian law and to international trials. However, the fact remains that this mission is at odds with this vision of the trial and the trials generally, the DICT trials, uh, uh, the vision that is based on the idea that uh, the, the historical the historical truth should be should be established and that the historical narrative should be should be developed. Now, has uh, the book the book points points out in, in, in one crucial part of it? It points out the ambitions uh, of the of the prosecution. It says that uh, the pro prosecutor really wanted to prove comprehensive guilt. So the result of that was a very complex. Uh, procedure which required uh, the, you know, the 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 inter uh, provision of evidence from from a number of, of witnesses coming from different parts of the former Yugoslavia from different situations, with different levels of complexity within different uh, 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 contexts. So it was it was a very demanding case, and the fact that Slobodan Milosevic died uh, prematurely uh, could be interpreted as 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 as, as a way of sort of uh, uh, as, as a fortunate event you know, in this context because if you want to create a narrative then this narrative should conform to certain criteria that make any narrative effective intelligible and uh, valuable for the for the understanding of history Maria Schechtman has has written famously about what what a narrative needs to needs to accomplish in order to be a useful narrative and according to her, there are two basic conditions for a narrative to be effective. Uh, the so-called articulation condition, which means that the narrative should be sufficiently simple and should sufficiently uh, uh, articulate to be, to be intelligible to, to everyone. And the so-called reality condition, which means that the narrative should correspond to, as she says, salient features of reality as they are known to all of us in order to be acceptable as, as a sane, as, as both a sane and, and a useful story of the events. Uh, now, the ideal narrative, if you look at it from, from an abstract point of view, what is an ideal narrative if you present it graphically? It's, it's, it's a simple straight line where there's a consensus on the meaning of, thing, of things, and these things and these, these meanings correspond to, to reality. Uh, the more complex the narrative is, the more twisted up, warped up, the more confused it is, the less effective it is. And I would add to these conditions that Maria Schechtman posits, I would add the condition of consistency when the narrative applies to international war crimes trials. If the narrative is not consistent, it loses its normative power and it loses its de facto influence and its de facto ability to serve these goals of preventing impunity and contributing to reconciliation. You know, Slobodan Milosevic, as we all know, was a, was a highly controversial character. He was, at one stage, he was a charmer, and it was very, uh, very attractive for international negotiators to work with him, simply, even though he was called the butcher of the Balkans and, and a dictator, because uh, it was highly rewarding for diplomats to come to Belgrade, sit on his couch, make a deal with him, and then go out onto the patio with him and give a statement to the media that the done deal was a done deal. There was no need for... Uh, a parliamentary verification for negotiation with the opposition for the usual complications that apply in a democracy. So this is the charm of dealing with dictators and uh, foreign diplomats took advantage of that a lot. On the other hand, he was portrayed in the international media as the very face of evil in, in the Balkans. So the trial really was an opportunity to, to set the record straight, but in order for this uh, goal to have been accomplished, it would have been necessary for all these uh, well elaborated aspects of the work of ICTI to have been very different, uh, to be more consistent, to be uh, more just, to be more impartial, to be more comprehensive than they really have been and than they really remain. So, uh, uh, what, what is really what is the legacy of the Milosevic trial for Serbia? for the former Yugoslavia. Has the Milosevic trial really changed the perceptions of Milosevic uh, in Bosnia, in Croatia, in Kraina, in Belgrade, in Republika Srpska? 
has it contributed to setting the historical record straight in a way that would be minimally obligatory for everyone, that, that, would, that would command a minimum of consensus on the basic facts? Uh, this is an open question. To me, I think that because of this failure to establish a minimum level of consensus on the truth, uh, we could probably say that uh, that the whole trial uh, has rather contributed to this warped, warped perception of the narratives that Dikti <coughs> has produced so far, rather than than clarifying clarifying the picture. You know, in 1997 or 8, I think I was at a NATO meeting in Bratislava. At that time, uh, NATO invited people from the NGOs and, you know, from academic institutions rather than state representatives because uh, Yugoslavia was under sanctions and was diplomatically excluded. And there was a, an interesting discussion between the then Bosnian ambassador to the UN, later the Bosnian foreign minister, who is now in jail in America, I think, uh, and the former political director of the uh, British Foreign Office, uh, Pauline Neville Jones, and some other diplomats who, were, who, who had the opportunity to deal directly with Milosevic. And if, if I was listening to them and I couldn't believe what they were saying, they were describing Milosevic as the hero of the Balkans. To them, he was the star. He was the guy who could solve everything. He was the only relevant person to talk to. And then when you compare that, with the press statement after that conference and with the official version of Western policy towards Milosevic, you get the same discrepancy that you get uh, when you look at the trial from a number of the angles that this book elucidates and when you look at the way in which uh, uh, Milosevic's legacy has really been treated, not just in his trial but in the other trials in ICTI. Look at, look at the decision, the recent decision to acquit Yavitz Astanisic and Franko Simatovic. Some commentators have asked uh, how, how Milosevic could have possibly been guilty if Jovic Stanisic was innocent. When Franko Simatovic. So was Milosevic, would Milosevic have been found guilty? Uh, these, this is, this is the, the sort of problem that you get from, from these twisted up narratives when, when, when the perspective when, when, when the role of the tribunal in, in the creation of narratives is not clear to the judge, judges and, and the chambers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we open the floor for your questions, I would actually have one question for both of our speakers today. Uh, up to the point, I already asked Professor Waters a similar question uh, when we talked about this presentation. Uh, I remember that Carlo del Ponte uh, one interview she gave uh, during the Milosevic process and the journalist asked her if her intention was to actually create this historical narrative, if her intention was to influence the history of the Balkans and her answer was uh, resolutely no, and that her intention was just to uh, stick to a very technical uh, side of her job and actually um, the main intention, of course, was uh, to get to uh, some sort of justice in the way you, uh, whatever we uh, define that, that concept. So it seems that somehow in this type of cases we get to a paradox. On the one hand, uh, all these tribunals can't act otherwise but uh, produce some sort of history and historical narratives. Because ultimately, if you get to a verdict, if you charge someone, uh, there is already uh, something uh, defining his history in a certain way and influencing both the present and the future. But on the other hand, uh, we come to this uh, uh, also quite uh, theoretical and philosophical, if you want, question, uh, should, should it really be uh, the job of tribunals to establish consistent historical narratives or even influence them. And in that context, we heard from both presenters the concept of historical truth, uh, which is very uh, useful, also very manipulative, uh, and also something that you need to have in each particular society to just be operational uh, in each given historical context, but also <coughs> something that is ultimately, ultimately very manipulative. Uh, 
So how would you how would you respond to this? Uh, what seems to me as an imminent uh, paradox in these kind of tribunals. Uh, maybe if you could answer first, and then. Well, I, uh, in terms of theory of criminal law, I tend to be a deontologist in, in moral theory of criminal law, and I think that the purpose of international trials, just the same as the purpose of national criminal trials, should be to establish a sense of proportionality between the crime and the treatment that is meted out to the offender, a sense of justice. Uh, uh, we see, I think, from, from the records of ICTI, that this is putatively the goal, but this is not the practice. Uh, I will not quote the, the numerous examples, numerous cases where, you know, people who have uh, 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 admitted to have assassinated uh, hundred and, 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 and more uh, uh, prisoners and, and have simply admitted their guilt and, you know, have, have agreed to be witnesses against others, have been given uh, symbolic sentences. Uh, on the other hand, you have people like uh, uh, General Blaskic. Uh, who was initially given a, a, a monstrance sen sen sentence of 40 years, I think, or, or was it 40 years for the crimes against the Muslims in the Lashfa Valley, and this sentence was later the, 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 the overturned, it was basically uh, turned into what he had already served in, in, in detention. So this is obviously a fishy practice, and, and, and I'm not really sure how, how I would theoretically frame it. I, I think what tribunals really do in terms of creating narratives is not necessarily what they set out to do. It is simply what they, what they, what, 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 what they must do once, once they're established. It is a natural sort of pro, uh, consequence of, of their operation. But this doesn't mean that they shouldn't be aware of this consequence and that they shouldn't try to manage it. And, and this is where I feel ICTI has, has, has failed to a large extent. Uh, I, I, I largely agree with this. Uh, so, I mean, you're right. Uh, if you ask, you know, Da Ponte or anyone else, any actor uh, uh, at a institution like the ITDY in a formal or public setting, they're going to adopt the the model of, of uh, forensic, shall we say, professional narrowness. Right? We try individuals, and they will issue the larger. Uh, uh, historical claims, right? They will absolutely reject, for example, the idea that there's anything collective here. They'll do the exact opposite and say what we're doing is focusing on individual guilt in order to dispel mythologies of collectivism uh, and so forth, So, I think, which is a related idea, I think. But in reality, uh, of course, they, they understand to some degree that, that they are inevitably caught up in or have the opportunity to tell broader claims that might do something, and they embrace this goal, I think. Again, not formally, but practically they do. Uh, 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 and you can see this, the same Del Ponte who says no history is, is almost schizophrenic in her introduction to the, tribunal, to the trial about we will only be writing a little bit of the history, but the bloodiest part, so, so we're going to write history, just not the whole of history. Uh, so clearly denying it while doing it. Um, and, and uh, I think this, as I say, arises because the opportunity is inevitable uh, in, the, in, the, in the way these tribunals have been formed, the constituencies that are behind them. Those constituencies want an accounting. They want a grand, comprehensive, transformative claim. They don't want a narrow trial. Who would fund such an institution if you really went to the Security Council and said, we'll try you know, 20, 30, 40 people and we'll say nothing else about the broader conflict, you'll, you'll get no money. So we can expect to see this claim in the, in the future. But uh, my point, and I maybe should mention this, uh, I forgot to mention in my presentation, although this book is now done, um, it, for me it's part of a much broader project, a set of papers I'm now working on, all of which relate to different ways of thinking about the problem of trials as an agent of truth-telling and reconciliation. So the other parts, the very much exactly the points you mentioned, um, I, I'm working on a paper now on very much on this question of what happens if everyone below Milosevic is acquitted? What story comes out of the tribunal? And related to that, a second claim has to do with this problem of even if we think tribunals tell narratives, they don't just tell one, they tell multiple conflicting narratives. So we have the example of you know, Perisic's conviction and then acquittal on appeal, which story tells what, how do we relate different trials together. I actually spoke with Justice Goldstone recently, uh, and it's a classic example of this. 
I asked him this problem of multiple narratives, and his view was a classic prosecutorial view. Each prosecutor should pursue that case to conviction. And if in the next courtroom we're telling the opposite story, that's not a problem. Uh, clearly it's a problem though, right? If you want to use the institution to produce some sort of truth that will transform. It's a real problem if two different courtrooms are producing mutually exclusive stories or divergent stories. So I have these. A third part of it is looking at the problem of secrecy at this tribunal. Such a large portion of the jurisprudence is actually secret that if you, be if you believe in the capacity for trials to tell truth, it is clearly a problem if that truth is, uh, is hidden and we have only judgment with defective texts beneath it. So there are many ways in which I think, although it is an inevitable aspiration, it's a defective one. And so therefore, I return to the idea that we should move towards radically limited forensic trials that make no effort to tell stories about conflict whatsoever. We should be reducing it to the kind of minimum, uh, should we say, general inhumanity of uh, murder, rape, crimes that we can point to as context, as, as, as being uh, unacceptable without reference to their context. Do you think that's uh, realistic? No, no, I mean, politically it's unlikely, but uh, as you said, uh, it is essential that these institutions be brought to awareness and their constituencies about the problems. So uh, it's, not, it's not realistic in an absolute, you know, as a full project. I think it is realistic to imagine pushing uh, our skepticism forward several degrees. Thank you.